Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Joining us in studio today is a man of many firsts, the first ever second gentleman, the first Jewish spouse of a U.S. vice president, and the first person to be without a phone at the West Hollywood Soul Cycle <laughs> when his <laughs> wife called to say she just became the likely Democratic nominee for president. Doug Emhoff hey. is here. Uh, Doug, welcome to the pod. Good to see you all. Doug. Doug, Doug, oh. Doug. And welcome back home to Los Angeles. Where's your signs? Yeah, where are it's signs? great to be home. It's great to be here. Yeah. So 45 days ago, uh, your life was still normal enough for you to be getting coffee with your L.A. friends at SoulCycle. You now have 61 days uh, to help your wife defeat Donald Trump and make history as the next president of the United States. Uh, what has it felt like to get shot out of a cannon like this? <laughs> like, how have your lives changed? How much of your lives changed? Yeah, it's so it's so interesting to be right back in L.A. in Hollywood. I was at West the West Hollywood Soul Cycle, which I used uh, to go to all the time. The nine thirty Soul Survivor <laughs> class. So I did okay. sixty minutes oh, at, at my advanced age, and I was with my my friend. So we we walked mm -hmm. out. And, you know, people were coming by and saying hi. I was like, you know, we're going to be fine. Don't worry. Everything's good. And um, we're just, I've known these, I've known them a long time. And then, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes in, my friend's partner just shows me the phone. And at first I thought it was fake. Then I don't believe it. Then being a good lawyer, I always read the last line first. And that, if you recall, was something like, I will address the nation later this week, thinking, oh, he's coming back from COVID. Mm. And so he said, read above that. And then, you know, you see this whole crew I have. I said, let's go. We got to go. And we're running. And if you know that soul cycle, it's not like the car's two feet away. It's no. several no. hundred yards. Just so I'm running, running. Jumping over gate guys left and right. <laughs> just <laughs> in the car. Gate, just <laughs> glitter and things dodging. Yeah, yeah. no. It's and a, then to go a, from that, mm -hmm. the phone, like I've said, it's like literally steam is coming out of it. And it's some variation of call Kamala, call Kamala. And it wasn't just her calling. It was every family member, including my kids and my parents. It's like, where are you? And then I finally talked to her and she said, where the F were you? <laughs> I need you. It's a tough one. And um, it was a very short conversation. And then it really has been like getting shot out of a cannon because the next day I was in Wilmington um, addressing the, the now Harris campaign. And it was so surreal, too, because the president called in. So just as I was about to go up on stage and I had barely seen her and it had been 72 hours since I had seen her since this all happened. And I just about to walk out there and then you hear Joe's voice and we all, it just, it just hit so hard. Yeah. And That's then I point. went out and introduced her and then it's just been nonstop. It has literally been nonstop. I've barely seen her. I've been back and forth across the country several times. I've been to Paris for the Olympics Oh yeah. in the middle of all this wow. and the convention in the middle of all this, including the speech. And that feels like a distant memory because two weeks later, I've literally been crisscrossing the country still. Um, so that's how it's been. Very little time to reflect. And there's not a lot of like happy couple chit chat with us. It's not like, hey, this is pretty amazing. She's like, get back to work. <laughs> yeah. well, that was like, you can't even say anything to her because she's so focused that it's just, yeah, I'm not going to pay attention to that. Just get, get back out on the road. One thing that was interesting because you, you talked about this, that basically because you had been at SoulCycle and then getting some food after, like this 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 ship was sailing. Was there a, any conversation like, hey, are we doing this? Like, was there any kind of like, sh hey, do you wanna run for president? Was there, it was just, it was happening. By the time I talked to her, she had already been on the phone with the president and had already been working the phones to, to nail down the, um, the nomination, so. It was our, it was minute forty five no. of Soul Survivor that it happened. Yeah. So. I guess I lost. I guess because I didn't answer the phone the first time, I lost any right of uh, you know, negotiation. Because over. you're on your way. You you have some stake in this. You're going to be first gentleman. Do you think they should put a little plaque on that seat Ooh. that said, "This is where Doug's butt was when Joe Biden stepped aside"? So apparently, it's a thing. Like, I guess some reporters have shown up there to try to so check out the class, and like, "Ooh, this was the Soul Cycle class he was in." But I've been. That was, you know, my normal routine when I'm here. Not enough arms. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know it's a problem. Like, you you know it's a problem. Weights, it's like, like two here, 45 minutes in, it's like, here are some free weights. It feels like an afterthought, and they should, I, they should talk about it. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also, like, just having worked on campaigns, presidential campaigns, 
I mean, usually it's like a, it's a two year process yeah. and the number of things that you uh, and the vice president are having to do in less than a hundred days is unbelievable. I mean, we were joking before we started recording that we had gotten uh, podium passes from a friend at the convention to go up to the very front to watch uh, Michelle Obama and Barack Obama speak, which meant when you were coming off stage for your speech, we were literally standing there and almost accidentally greeted you in this like incredible moment. Luckily, you did not remember until I reminded you, but it's just another thing you had to do right away was right get away. the speech done. Yeah, and that that speech, because when we were still on the VP side, you know, as second gentleman, um, I think I was gonna speak, but I'm sure it would have been um, somewhere, yeah. maybe. Couple and, couple minutes and in the so early then in the night. when when she she got on the the top of the ticket they said okay you're gonna have a, a bigger speech we're not sure when and I just assumed I'd be introducing her foolishly on Thursday and then they said we're 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 moving it around then I found out pretty close on that you're going Tuesday and you're going prime time and I said oh okay who am I speaking with the Obamas you mean Barack <laughs> and Michelle Obama. Yeah, you're going to go, and then that's like our primetime package, you and the, and the Obamas. I said, okay, I need to work on this speech. Because yeah, they're intimidating, because <laughs> they're very good speakers, famously. <laughs> As it turns out, they are. Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to uh, your wife's speech, which got rave reviews, almost everyone we talked to and all the reports we saw, people mentioned three speeches, which is the Obamas' speeches and yours. Um, like, what? that was obviously the probably the biggest audience you've ever spoken to. How how did the how did you want the speech to go? Did you practice? Were you nervous about uh, addressing a big audience like that? Um, I knew I needed to be able to talk about her. And a little bit about myself too, because I, even though a second gentleman married to the vice president, uh, I'm out there a lot. It's not like, and people know me, but it's not the same. Yeah. And so it, the part of it was, you know, who am I? Just a little intro on myself. And um, and who is she? The Kamala Harris that I know that I wanted everyone else to know that those of us in her family know. And then when you see the caricatures of her and the parody and the, the you know her a little bit, that's just yeah. not her. And so for all of us, there's just been this, it's just been, not been amusement. It's just like, that's just, it's just not you. And so I think part of what I wanted to do is just show the world the, the woman I married, the woman I love, the woman who was there for mm -hmm. me at a, you know, a rough time in my life, who was able to come in and, and be mamala to the kids mm -hmm. and be now really great friends with my ex-wife and, and integrate with her family. And so I just wanted everyone to see what we get to see each and every day. But I also wanted to talk about her as a badass, like she's the joyful warrior. So that kind of part about her was the joyful part. Let's end with the badass warrior, the, the person I also see, the person that I was fearful of when she was attorney general and I was representing business clients. And then I'm like, oh, I wonder what she's gonna be like on a date. She was great. And so to show that side, the, the woman who grilled those those folks in the Judiciary Com Committee, the woman who's on the world stage, the woman that we see, because we're in the office of vice president. So mm -hmm. we also get to see her at work each and every day as vice president, Oval Office, Situation Room, doing all the stuff that we see. Um, and then, she just stepped up because we talk about how surreal it was that I wasn't there, but was also that she just stepped up when we needed somebody to step up. This country needed a leader to step into the void, step into the breach, and she did that. And so to, to say that to the whole world on that stage, that was what I wanted to cross. It was... Um, I, I don't get nervous really. I mean, I, I I'm a, was a trial lawyer here in Hollywood, so I you know you, you yeah. can't you no know, you, you, no one wants to hire a shaky lawyer. So you always learn to be really calm in highly stressful situations. You got to be prepared. So a lot of the skills that I've already brought to the table as a lawyer here um, really help. But mm. nothing prepares you for that. Yeah. Nothing. And and so you walk out there. And you see the Doug signs, and you, it's like the, the noise and the intensity. I'm looking up. I, my parents are up there. And my son had directed the video. It's a beautiful It was video. amazing. He introduced me. 
And so I'm a little, I was a little shaky because I had all this plan, you know, that Mike Tyson, you always have a plan until you get uh-huh. hit in the face. So <laughs> I almost felt like, okay, you better regroup, take a breath. And I, if you see that tape of it, I just, <sighs> yeah. And then reset. And then I just, just went for it. That's awesome. Beta blocker? What are, the, what are those things called? Yeah, beta blocker. You can yeah, take a beta, beta, beta blocker. blocker. Yeah. Uh, the speech went well. Have you thought about a debate? Maybe challenging Melania to a debate. <laughs> <laughs> we can just, we'll, we can table that. Right? <laughs> Super front with you. All right, I'm going to ruin the vibes here. Um, so on, on Tuesday night, you uh, attended a vigil yeah. for Israeli hostages being held in Gaza. And so, you know, the last 11 months, I think, have been uh, unimaginable for those hostages, their families. Mm-hmm. Uh, the news over the weekend that six hostages had been executed um, and found just days after that execution. It's just, you know, it's unbearable. Um, one of the people killed was an Israeli-American named Hirsch Goldberg Poland. I know you yeah. spent a lot of time with his family. And so I just, I wanted to ask you about your impressions from that vigil, but also about a disconnect I feel in the conversation about Gaza in the U.S. versus in Israel. In Israel, it feels like people are clear-eyed that Hamas is responsible for October 7th. They are responsible for the execution of these hostages. They're an evil terrorist organization. Everyone is clear-eyed about that. But there are many people in the streets also blaming Bibi Netanyahu for his failure to, uh, to get to yes on a ceasefire and hostage release deal. Um, but in, in the U.S., in the U.S. coverage, in the U.S. political debate, including statements out of the Biden administration, I feel like it's far less direct about the frustration with Netanyahu than what you hear in Israel. And so I was just wondering if you agree with that observation, um, if it's something you've seen, and if you think you know the, the, the missing piece to get to yes on that hostage release deal is maybe more pressure on Netanyahu's government. Well, let me let me start with the first part about you know what it was like to to be there last night at Addison D.C. Um, and remember, the parents um, John and Rachel spoke at yeah. the DNC. I think just two weeks ago yeah. did a beautiful, beautiful th- job. And they too. were just yeah. the strength. And what I talked about last night about them was in that speech. You know, they were almost just reminding the vast majority of people you know, what had happened uh, on October 7th, uh, that Hamas was responsible, that women and babies and grandmas and, and young people at a music festival were murdered, tortured, raped. And um, there's people who don't know that, and actually there's people, even worse, that don't believe it. So the fact that even though their son at that time was, was had been in captivity for many many months they use that time to educate the public and mm-hmm. to educate about the the plight of not only their son but of others and to talk to them over the weekend when their son had been executed just shot with five other people you know execution style in cold blood when they were you know almost about to be rescued uh, just unbearable. But on that phone call, again, we had met them. I, I saw them at the convention. Uh, Kamala had met them several times. And then to just their strength, their grace, their compassion, and their empathy towards us, the, the fact that they were concerned about how we were doing when we couldn't even find the words to, to, tell, to talk to them about how mm-hmm. sorry we were. So, I mean, I'm just so on the human element, that's what last night was about. Yeah. It was um, a vigil for those victims. It was uh, families of, of survivors, families of those killed there. And it was a way for the community to just come together. And I'm a part of the community. So I, I really approached that as a Jew, as a congregant, as a mourner, someone to pray with them and to just really express how I feel. And, and in terms of the politics of that, I mean, I'm not going to address it. I mean, that's not for me to do um, I know um, she's working on this night and day, as is the president. I know there has to be um, a deal. There needs to be consequence for Hamas, and there needs to be um, and the leaders, and you, you've seen that, and um, there needs to be a peace, and that's what they're working towards. And so 
that that that's what the administration is doing. So there was this moment during uh, President Biden's last day of the union. Uh, it's where you're up in the stands and the vice president is standing behind Joe Biden and you're kind of trying to get her attention and you finally get her attention. And there's this incredible look between the two of you. I loved it. It's really moving. It, was, it seemed to just as somebody just watching from the outside, just two people who genuinely love each other and people really took to it. Uh, the last man to almost become first gentleman was a former president with a not insubstantial ego of his own. <laughs> uh, you are seeking not just a supportive role, but a role that is both official and unpaid because it's gendered, because it is based on the presumption that the president is a man and his spouse is a woman. How do you think about that? How, does, how do you think about addressing that? Well, I'll take your question in parts. <laughs> I think the first part, yes, I love my wife very much. <laughs> and, Good. Uh, Softball. It's hardball and, questions uh, today. <laughs> and, you know, but this is part of the, um, that there's, everyone's watching everything. So you're almost, I'm sitting there, I'm up there. It's like, wow, there's my wife, you know, sitting behind the president at the State of the Union. And each State of the Union, there's been something where I've like waved and <laughs> blew a kiss. Um and it's always on camera, so you, you've, those moments are. But that's us. I mean, we're you're still trying to be a normal couple amongst all this stuff. Um, Bill Clinton, he, um, I, I've developed a, a, a pretty good relationship with him. He's been, really been there for me and and for the, uh, Kamala as just as someone who's been through all this. Someone who is just so smart and and still follows everything so so well. And we did an event after the convention, right after, and he introduced me at an event. I'm thinking, I just spoke with the Obamas, and now Bill Clinton's introducing me. And here I am, this entertainment lawyer from right here where we're sitting. <laughs> just so surreal. <laughs> but he said, and here's the man who's trying to get the job that I tried to get for 20 years, <laughs> Doug Emhoff, the next first gentleman. So um, I've, I've thought a lot about your actual question. Um, how to how to approach just being second gentleman as the first man ever to do this role, and someone who loved my career very much. I was very good at it, very successful. Said humbly with modesty, but <laughs> it's true. And um, I miss it. But to to take a step back, so my wife can become vice president, was something I, I gladly did. I did it without bitterness, without anger, and. Then with her, you know, her goading was, what are you going to make of this role? You know, try to find something in this role that you can move the needle on. And those were, one was really being the first guy doing this. Let's talk about gender issues. So I talked a lot about gender equity, pay equity, family leave, child care. Then, of course, when Dobbs hit, I spent two years talking to men about why the Dobbs issue and reproductive freedom and this crisis that Dobbs has caused is, is an issue for all of us, not just for women. And then being the first Jew, it's first Jewish principle ever. Um, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. There's a lot of hate. Lean into that. And so that's how I approached it. And that's how I'll continue to approach it if we are so fortunate to win the election, which we have to win. Um, I'm going to approach it the same way. Where can I be most useful to her as her husband, support her, love her, mm -hmm. as always, and but be there for her. But also, how can I help her as president, help the administration, help the American people being the first? And what issues can I really drive? But also, there's a lot of traditions that are really cool. I've tried to uphold those as second gentlemen. Uh, fun fact, as second gentlemen, I am the president of the Senate spouses because she's the president of the Senate. Ah. And I was a former Senate spouse. And so, you know, there's a there's some lunches, there's an event at the vice president's residence. So I just made sure that I participated in those traditional events. And as first gentlemen, there's certain traditions that I fully expect that I will faithfully uphold. So I, I'm a gay person, and I'm and and I notice that at, if you go to a fancy hotel, there's a presumption that there's going to be a man and a woman in that room because you'll they'll be things that are meant for men and things that are meant for for a woman. When you're at the observatory, when you're in any of these events, have you ever gone into a space and you're like, oh, no one ever thought a man would be here before? Day one, 
because there's actually a org chart for everything in the government, including the office of the vice president. And the first org chart that was presented to us said something like, you know, vice president at, on the top, and then there's a line to, it said second lady, they crossed it out and just said second spouse. And then under that, it said family life. And we said, okay. She, she said something like, yeah, we're doing that together. And, <laughs> and so the implication was that I would be in charge of family life, family family life. life and Oof, whatever wow. else that entailed. So um, we just played through it. And, you know, again, as second gentleman, I spent most of my time, first year vaccinations, uh, getting the economy going uh, again, supporting the American Rescue Plan. And throughout, I spent most of the time helping her and helping the administration. And that's how I would approach uh, being first gentleman, how, whatever the flow chart there is, um, because it's it's it helps her. I mean, I'm there to, to support her. And also, look, this is a two way street. It's not a one sided deal. I mean, when I was a practicing lawyer, I mean, we supported each other's careers. And I mean, she knew this was going to be difficult for me to step away, even though, again, I did it gladly. So she has really um, enabled me through her support to lean into issues like anti-Semitism, lean into these other issues, and and be able to to go out there and do a lot of really amazing things as second gentleman. And that's what I expect to do, whatever yeah. the, the chart says. It's uh, it's been pointed out that you and and Tim Walls are presenting a very different, healthier version of masculinity uh, in this campaign uh, than. Trump and J.D. Vance, who are obviously selling a very different version that appeals to their base voters. Um, but also, like, the voters who haven't decided yet in this election are more likely to be younger, more moderate men. Uh, the New York Times just ran a piece about how, quote, the Trump campaign has been aggressively courting what might be called the bro vote, the frat boy flank, <laughs> a slice of 18 to 29 year olds yeah. that has long been regarded as unreliable and unreachable, but that Republicans believe may just swing the election this year. How do you think about, in the campaign, what it will take to motivate that group of young men to vote for Kamala Harris? I know, you know, your son Cole is 29, so he's in that uh, demographic we have as him. well. Yeah, you got, yeah. Well, he did the video. I hope, that I hope he's going to put that in the wind column. I'm actually going to go do my fantasy football draft with him right after this. Oh, so, amazing. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll come, we're going to come back to that. Yeah, we're going to come back to that. Yeah, so great, you know, great question. It's something we've I've thought a lot about, not just because of the election. I've just thought a lot about this, this state of, of where we are as, as men and how I can how I can talk about it. And I what I've learned, uh, I think, through trial and error is just to talk about me and what I do and, and how I feel and how I felt even as a young man. So when mm -hmm. I was married to Kirsten, we both had big careers and supported each other, supported her. And so for me, it was just kind of where my mindset was. Um, growing up is that I'm going to be somebody who is supportive of, of my partner and their career and other women. I came up through law firms and, you know, you can see we, we start around, you know, 50, 50 men and women in the law firm. And by the time I left through four years ago, the equity senior equity partner ranks where I was, was, you know, very low percentage of women. And it's just not right. It's not fair. And um, so that's, again, why I tried to use the second gentleman perch to just talk about just fairness, like what's fair, what's not. And sports, um, using um, women's sports as a way to talk about pay equity, training equity, travel equity, media rights equity, and all the things we're now seeing are starting to, to get better. And that's a good thing. And that means there's more men watching women's sports and more people watching women's sports and we're happier for it. So there's lots of ways to do it, lots of ways to reach them. But I've learned that you can't be a scold, you can't, you know, lecture, you just try to show by example. And one one great story is on the, in this post Dobbs, there's a group literally called a group called Men's Men for Choice. Mm. And it's primarily men in college and just out of college, maybe up until their late 20s, early 30s. And so they understand that it's, one, it's the right thing to do. It's not fair if women are being treated, literally being treated as less than, but also it impacts so many other rights. Uh, and you saw what 
Thomas said in the concurring opinion of Dobbs, anything based on this Griswold right of privacy, which Roe v. Wade was, um, is at risk. Gay marriage, contraception, yeah. you know, literally the right to do what you want in your bedroom. This is where cue the Tim Walls, you know, mm -hmm. uh, memes yeah. of, you know, stay out of my damn bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's what we're talking about. Do you think By the way, he's a great guy. Yeah. He's a good Tim Walls. I thought he was in the room. <laughs> yeah, so it's the f one good, two funny Tim Walls stories are ready within a few weeks. So I met him once uh, as second gentleman out on the road. I was in St. Paul doing a small business event. I was very impressed. You know, he knew about business and the economy. And then I didn't see him until that night in Philly when we jumped up on the stage. <gasps> oh, wow. And so we kind of bonded backstage and... We get up there and we just do this big bro bear <laughs> hug. And I cannot tell you how many texts I got from my actual friends and actual family members like, you never hugged me like that. What's <laughs> going you, on? You literally just met this guy. Did you hit him on the back? Walls pill. Did yeah. you hit him on the back to to, to preserve your, your heteronormativity? Did you give him the back pat? No, no, you see the embrace. video, we just did this full on. Oh, nice. And I think, you know, he was like this, I was like this. And then it was just this bro hug. And um, I heard from a lot of actual friends. And then the other one, I loved when he said, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And I said, <laughs> I'll sleep on November 6th. I want to actually enjoy the That's fruits fair. of yeah. winning this election. The vice president has a debate with Donald Trump next week. She does? I, yeah. I, oh, I, I, well, we hope. Yes. Um, I assume no one has debated with her more often than you have. Do you have any, <laughs> what should we expect here? What, what would she look for? I haven't won one. Yeah. So she I, mute your mic. Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, she is a very good debater. I mean, if you look at some of her debates, I th you know, look at her debate with Mike Pence. Um, she had a pretty infamous debate with Loretta Sanchez when she was running for Senate. Yep. Um, so, and she's also a first-class trial lawyer. Right. First-class, I mean, a first-class lawyer and a first-class trial lawyer. And um, I would say some, you know, the funny husband wife story. It's not like we're in a debate, but. I realize if we're talking about something, any really good lawyer will lay little traps for you along the way. And as I'm going through this discussion about some husband wife thing, I said, uh -huh. oh, that's what you're doing. You I minds. was a pretty good trial lawyer yeah. too. I said, aha. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, she is very, uh, very, you know, disciplined. She's very prepared. You know, she's a, again, a first class lawyer and a first class um intellect and um you know that that's how she's going to approach everything so it's donald trump so who who the hell knows right. what what you're going to get but i know from her you know she's going to be talking about us she's going to be talking about the american people she's going to be talking about the issues that she's been talking about she's going to be talking about moving us forward talking about this economic plan talking about our standing in the world and i mean literally Everything I just said, including the abortion issue, um, there's such a clear contrast. I mean, this is such a binary, clear contrast. And I think just getting folks to understand that and pay attention to know that everyone's life would be remarkably worse if somehow this guy who's completely unfit for office ever returned. Um, it just, people will be so far uh, worse off including business folks who think, oh, well, maybe he was good on the economy. One, that's not true. But two, think about the things he's saying. One of the bases of a great economy is stability. Yeah. It's lack of chaos. It's rule of law. It's it's our court systems. It's all the capital markets. It's um, innovation. It's, it's trade. It's all these things that make really make our economy great, make our country great. And you would think this place is going down the tubes the way Donald Trump talks about it, but I love the way she talked about it. This country is awesome. And to see, um, to hear the USA chants in Paris at the Olympics where you expect to hear them, but then to come back mm -hmm. and hear them at a democratic convention where you may not normally expect to see that and hear that, why were you hearing that? Because she, her vision of our country is, is more accurate of what we're experiencing and where she can take it and we know he's already was terrible the first time, terrible, even pre-COVID. 
And then COVID is probably the biggest dereliction of duty of any president in history. Hundreds of thousands of people died because he lied about COVID. He continued to lie about it. Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah, and then he fomented an insurrection when that? he lost the other yeah, election. So, it. yeah, it wasn't great. So this is what we're dealing <laughs> with. So she's going to just talk about the issues that actually help people, and he's just going to lie and talk about himself. What was your relationship to politics when you met Kamala Harris? Were, had, have you always been politically active? Have you always had, like, strong political views? I mean, I've always been a dem. Um, I, again, you know, building my career, so I was more focused on building my my career and um, raising the kids. And uh, I, w I wasn't like... Your brain was not broken by politics like all of us. I didn't know, like I wouldn't have known like whatever precursor you guys there were before. In the They've before never done times. this before. Right, you're, you guys are one off. But, <laughs> yeah, I was like most, I was just out there. I was, I cared about our country. I cared about the issues. I voted and I, I followed it when there were elections, but I wasn't like obsessively, you know, watching stuff and reading stuff because I was out there trying to support my big, beautiful blended family. No, that was before that. Right. I had a big, beautiful blended family. So I uh, support my family. And um, I got into it a little bit um, before I had met her, as it, as it turned out. As, you know, the kids were getting older mm -hmm. and it was election season. And I was starting to, to you know, donate some money. And it's LA. Go, You're getting to, invited to a fundraiser. No, I was going yeah, to, yeah, I was yeah. starting to go to events right, because yeah. I had more time and, and I was at a place where that seemed more interesting. And then I met her and then all of a sudden I started. And you had plenty of events to go well, to. Well, then I, <laughs> then I started going to lots of events and learning about it. And, um, but my first election was her attorney general reelect. And I was like, wow, politics is easy. You just like show up on election day and you get reelected. I didn't realize like <laughs> she was basically running unopposed. And then and even the Senate race, um, you know, it was it, it took a while and she ran for a while, but it was I was working full time. I, I was in and out of that. And um, really my first introduction is when she ran in the primary when I was like a weekend warrior and and went around um, helping around and then, uh, then it became a full time gig that day in August of 2020 when she got that call and then that that was my last day at the firm and I've been doing this ever since. Oh, that's amazing. All right, now it's time for some hardballs. Yeah, okay. Are you so ready? My goodness. <clears throat> so the LA Times published a list of some of your favorite restaurants. Okay. Okay. Some good important choices there. Two big problems with the list. First of all, Toscana, Douglas. <laughs> Toscana. Was that on there? It's 2024. <laughs> I'm barely here. <laughs> I, my point of reference is, is uh, we, I haven't been here a lot in the last four years. We're in a red sauce renaissance in this city. Are you not familiar with this? <laughs> I, I didn't know we were in a red sauce We're in a red sauce, sauce renaissance. renaissance. So okay. the thing is, I'm, I'm not here a lot. And so when I come back, I want to just re-experience the LA that I left behind in 2020 or even pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know many of the new places, and it's kind of hard to, you know, get around these days. So um, I've been here for ten years and never knew like the best Mexican food in LA. And then reading to prepare for this interview, I saw that you guys love El Cholo, and so after I was reading yesterday, my wife and I went to the Which original one? location. It's Vermont. like right down the street yeah. from us. We didn't even know. Yeah. Um, and fantastic. Isn't it amazing? Yes. Thank you for that recommendation. Well, I started <laughs> going to that one. I went to USC for law school and I started going there in the late 80s when I was in law school. I basically, that was part of my repertoire the whole time. So as soon as uh, I met Kamala, we just started going. And if we can't go, we is that is El Cholo? You're giving me the look on El Cholo. No, no, no. I'm good with El Cholo. Okay. I'm good with El Cholo. <laughs> I'm good with that. Yeah, okay. Craig's upset me. What about Craig? Craig's, Craig's, Craig's for the it's, it's, it's like fancy I, cars, photographers. You know what I mean? So Craig's, I think this is public, but it, we, we went on our first date there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it, and I, I knew Craig for a long time. And it was one of he those places Craig. where. He knew Craig. Um, the one in West Hollywood, right? Is there yeah. just one? Yeah. yeah. There's just one. And so that's kind of a special place just because that was literally our first date. And it's. um. It's very yeah. now. I, but again, I, I barely, yeah, I'm barely sorry. here. We're holding you to an unfair standard. I'm really just trying to see the kids or my parents or, you know, so it's yeah. not like I'm out 
hitting the town. So hard to get east of the 405 when you're. Uh, I told you know that <laughs> when is, you're just here. <laughs> that's, I'm glad you brought that up because when I'm talking to the team who are not from LA and they're they're giving me like the 15 minute travel time to get yeah. from the west side. No right at 4 p.m. Not I'm happening. Like, to, no. <laughs> Can't you roll? Literally an hour and 20 minutes. What Can we doing? roll lights and sirens now? <laughs> Uh, I think we got to win this election. Okay, let's win. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, second problem I have. Oh, my God. This is, may not be your fault. This may okay. be just the mainstream media once again letting us all down. But uh, there was no deli on that list. All right. And I, I just, I have a couple. Nate and Al's, Cantor's, Arts, Langer's. Where are we all going? Good. What are we so, ordering? Langer's is, um, and I read an article about Langer's in the LA Times that, you know, I think it's, it needs some love. Um, Langer's, the first... Yeah, I'm so old. The first stop on the original Metro line went from downtown 7th Street to right across the street from Langer's. So us lawyers would literally, like, whatever it costs, a quarter dollar, would go to lunch at Langer's, could take the new subway Metro line and go uh, go there. So um, love that place. What's our, what's our, what's our deli order? We're, um, we're fighting anti-Semitism. We're at the deli. What are we getting? I mean, you know, corned beef. It's, okay. it's kind of hard not to. But I try to eat a little healthier these days. So maybe I'm a, I'm a love dry tuna. So I, I get dry tuna at a lot of these delis. Dry too. tuna? Yeah. It's just, I don't know if you're going to win. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think not you can go around totally, to not talk like, about dry tuna. Not super dry, but, you know, just melt. Tuna melt. Okay, tuna, tuna melt. Love okay, tuna I love melt. a tuna melt. But the tuna, tuna has to be, it can't be, you know, super we saw the VP, you know, make a tuna melt. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's you know, right. The Mark Warner thing. Yeah, and also, oh, God, like, yeah, she, she, when we're here, she cooks. I mean, her thing is cooking Sunday dinner. And so, um, you know, she's amazing, um, near chef-like. So for me, it's like her cooking for us, cooking for the family. You, you're always winning. What are you doing with matzo? What are you doing with matzo? Um, I, I think I got her to make me matzo brai once. And okay. again, she okay. does everything great. So she, you know, puts her own touches in it. She probably threw some, some, some flavor and some spice in it. But, um, no, she, she's good. She, and I, I was not lying. She makes a very mean brisket oh, and okay. she puts a lot of love into it. And I read at these Sunday dinners, she spends like five hours on a bouillonnaise or whatever. And yeah. you do cocktails. Does that sound yeah. like? The well, kind of equity you're talking I, I think about during um, <laughs> what kind of cocktails are we drink? <laughs> well, I I do try. I try to to sous chef it up. She taught me uh, some of the knife skills. At, oh, not knife, you know, cutting yeah. food. Yeah, um, we do, we obviously do that. Shopping. <laughs> we didn't think you meant samurai. Shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been I've been famously. Like, okay. She got me onion goggles, which I put on a post uh -huh. once. Which like, oh my god, onion goggles. So I take that seriously. I try to help as much as I can, but. Now that she, usually the kids come over and everyone's getting older, so they all want to help her in the kitchen. So usually I'm just like making drinks, or now I might even cold lake. <laughs> I'm like down to just make picking the music, like putting a <laughs> playlist wow, on at this there. point. You so, know what though? It's, it's good though. Yeah. I'm like, this is great. You're fighting for gender equity. You stole your job from a from a woman. <laughs> And now we're just doing the playlist. Something to think about. It's something to think about. Can we, can we talk about sports for a minute? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's my understanding that you're you're a big sports fan. Is yes. it just L.A. Rams, Lakers, like all L.A.? Like what, what so I, I was born in Brooklyn okay. and moved here when I was 16. So there's still a vestige of New York teams. So okay. it's, a, it's a that's unfortunate hodgepodge of New York and L.A. teams. But I've been here. So you're a Yankees, Lakers fan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, well, Dot. so it's the Dodgers have superseded. Okay. Dodgers and Lakers superseded the New York teams, but the New York Giants are still in my in my DNA, and I love the Rams. But remember, the okay. Rams were not here. They were in Orange County, then right, they were in St. Right, Louis. Right. They came back, but since they've been back, it's been fantastic. So big Rams fan, but my, you know, kind of the, the team of my youth, which is still my team, is the New York football giants. Okay. And um, the Lakers and, and uh, Dodgers are, you know, they, they got, they kind of got in the blood. Now, I, I heard you tell my guy, Rich Eisen, that you hate Boston teams. 
And I just wondered yeah. if uh, Got a couple Boston guys. Well, for those of us who won a victory in November, <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if, if you we should be concerned that you seem to hate winning and just hate excellence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. A lot of electoral votes in going after Boston. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about success. <laughs> so it's so funny. My son and I went. He was in D.C. during the playoffs, and we we there were a lot of Boston fans. It was the finals. A lot of Boston fans in this big sports bar we were at, and. We were like not rooting for them, and a couple of fans were like, "Are you are you not rooting for us?" And I'm like, "Uh, secrets." Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're tough. Get, I will we're, say, one we're of assholes. Yeah, we are one of the, awful 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 one of the <laughs> highlights. But a lot of the folks on our team are are from Boston, so I've got a okay. Um, but one of the cool events is we went up to see Robert Kraft, who's been doing a lot of work on anti-Semitism, fighting anti-Semitism, and um, he gave me a tour of his office. And he has a shrine to all the Super Bowl trophies, mm -hmm. and I got to see that. I, one of which is dented. I think this story was by Gronk or something. Yeah, Gronk. And so hit a baseball with it. Yeah. So his office and and the rings. I got to meet the new coach, and um, Mayo. Yeah, yeah, but still not a fan. What are okay. with, <laughs> with Putin taking that ring? He still has it, I think. He still has yeah, it. He told right? me he sh he told me that whole story with Putin and the ring. Um, he was very gracious. He has some really cool stuff in his office, some amazing bespoke Tom Brady paraphernalia yeah. and, and just stuff going way back. So he's yeah. like a real sports fan and um, also really into politics. He had some great political yeah. stuff in there too. But the trophy room, it's like, it's one of those scenes you just see in one of these movies where it's just this big, long room <laughs> and there's nothing else in there except these trophies and they're just in this but case you, but you can't take them with you you cannot take them <laughs> you, with you. when you die yeah oh well, well you can be, can't be, be buried in a pyramid something to think about <laughs> yeah craft you know? uh, great owner uh is he happy don't love his politics <laughs> yeah no this is not political i went there not on politics but on the because on this fight against anti-semitism yeah. you know we're all yeah, on that been, one together and yeah. that's non-political maybe you can bring him to our side <laughs> um I, I do think my understanding is we have a hard out on this interview because your fantasy football draft is tonight. Now, uh, the question I think <laughs> is, is that a first for uh, that is Pod a first. America? But I think okay, that, I, I actually think that says a lot about you and your priorities because I think I've heard you say that this is a, a, a league you've been in for like 34 years with your yeah. law school buddies. Yeah. Or so, is this the White House League? No, the White House League. That draft was last night. Okay. Um, this this league is started in 1989 at USC. And it merged with my first law firm, which I started in 1990. So it's basically a bunch of guys that I went to law school with and worked together. But it's the same, basically the same crew and maybe a new owner here or there. But it's, and even the new owners have been there for 15, 20 years. We're all now of a certain age that most of us have kids and sons and daughters who are now in their 20s to mid, early to late 20s. Who have now come in to be a part of the league. So um, Cole joined me about eight or nine years ago, I think, when he was getting out of college. And we're a very hapless team. I, we, I, I won once in 2000. So 24 years ago, okay. I won once. And you can now, because it's been on one of the apps for so long, it's literally like 12 teams, 12, 12, 11, 10, 11, 12, 12. And then two years ago, we decided we got to just take this more seriously. We got to study. This is embarrassing. <laughs> so two years ago, we made the playoffs. And then last year, we we were the number one team the whole season. We got to the finals. And I even told the team, okay, if just, just tank. Let us win. And if you let us win, we'll do next year's draft in the White House. <laughs> Didn't work? Well, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so Wait. it didn't work. We lost. Um, but it was... Um, this is the year. This year, this, this league is so year. much fun. So the, the, I, I've got two great um, group chats. It's the one from my Jersey guys that I grew up with and this one of the team owners. And when I just said the word, and that's when I met my fantasy... They it, There's 500 messages on that group I chat. Um, just so... It's just so fun. Um that group chat got wild for your friends a couple of years ago. This is like uh, Meghan Markle's group chat all of a sudden when she met <laughs> Prince Harry. It's like, I'm sorry, what? What have you been up to? <laughs> Do they no? give you a lot of shit on the group chat now? Like, what's it been like the last couple of months? It, they always give me, we, we give each other a ton of shit yeah. because that's what a group chat does. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's surreal for them. 
I think the highlight of their lives was when I went on Matthew Berry to talk about our league and our team and my team and my draft. They just that's that better was than a more, convention. Yeah, that was that. I got I got a few. Hey, great speech. That was really good. <laughs> No, on the speech, but it was like, you said the fantasy team, Team Nirvana. and um, Team Nirvana. Team Nirvana. And like this is just like man. a spreadsheet. Uh, it was through Yahoo, I assume? Um, this That one's through ESPN. ESPN. Huh. Yeah, well, I don't know website. what it is. <laughs> I it's, never, it's, no one ever told me. It's, 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 it's really fun it's because fun. it's a way to watch the games, and now it's something that when the games are on, you're literally FaceTiming, texting all the, the people that you're – in the league with and it for Cole and I especially over these last four or five years it's so hard to stay connected to him and it's a, it's a great way for us to stay connected and to have something that's just for he and I and the fact that his dad came out here to to sit with him to do the draft he's he's just so happy right now that we're going to be and me too of course that we're able to do this so um it's it's a it's one little shred of normalcy yeah. uh, in a going back, yeah. bringing it all back to your first question, <laughs> the way good lawyers do, um, you know, that shot out of a cannon because we are traveling many hundreds of miles an hour right now. Yeah. And we're hustling for 60 some odd days to, like I said, to save our country, to win this election. But um, this is a working trip. I'm doing all these events while I'm here. But I'm also carving out this time for him because we still have to be parents to Colinella and and to everyone else in that family they still look to us we still got to be present and that was one of the great things about the convention bringing I mean everyone together and they were all there um, to, to just experience this thing together was um, special it's very cool. special beyond special we, we do want to just quickly show you that we did sell a mug with your face on it it Oof. says Doug on a mug I like the young Doug picture better Okay. That's, yeah. that's like super old, Doug. Well, we sure. didn't have one for you because they sold out. Yeah, they really? sold, sold out. like hotcakes. Yeah. Yeah. So now maybe really? the second round we'll I need, do. We'll have and because you're a lawyer, just so you know, I'm we are legally allowed we'll to use your license. Hold on. I'm going to just drop oh, to cease and desist. You can't. No, yeah. we can't. We, lawyer, we have lawyers too, Doug. Oh, this public domain. This is like fair use. No, yeah, you're a public figure. On the mug you go. Fair use, This huh? is commentary. This is satire. <laughs> satire. Parody. <laughs> parody. Yes. This is a parody You mug. know, I teach this stuff at Georgetown Law School, man. So yeah. it's, uh, yes, you, you are, you're right. screwing me, but it's okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, last question for you. What is one thing you know about your wife that you really hope the entire country gets to know over the next few months? Well, only one thing? Yeah, well, I figured. You See know. my speech. Um, <laughs> can I read you my speech? Yeah, right. No, that the... the she is a badass. I mean, she is a super badass um, on so many levels. And she has just done this. Her entire career has been for us. I know it's the, just for the people, but it literally has. And everything she does, it, there's always a, a why behind it. You know, she talked about why she became a, a prosecutor because of her best friend was being, unfortunately, molested by her yeah. stepfather. And you you track so much of her policy um, and and the stuff that she does to help us, there's always some family, there's always some reason. So here, famously, the, the mortgage crisis in California where they were giving Californians pennies on the dollar, and I was, I was here. And to see her fight for us because she's then thinking about her own mother and her the folks that she grew up with who worked so hard to get those homes and then to lose them like that. Um, it's the story about shutting down the for-profit colleges here, you know, and there's ripping off people. So for me, it's, I want people to know that she really gives a shit. Like she really does this stuff as, as a calling. It's yes, she's in politics, but I don't see her as a politician. I see her as a very devout public servant at the highest level. And she's devoted her whole, literally her whole professional career for us and that it's just great and you decide and I, to call a person like that at 8 30 in the morning from your car like she's a client like you're rolling calls <laughs> did your assistant I, you patch you what? through I, on a so, weekday just to it's just so go funny away. you say that because i'm it, it was it was like what am i doing and That's it was fun. that scene the other john favreau from uh <laughs> swingers yeah. and and it's literally that scene just <laughs> in my head what am i doing and then i'm like don't call back don't call back <laughs> and it's it he's just keeps calling back um <laughs> no that was it, it it's just because um you know i knew who she was and i was just curious like okay 
is this the person who's the, the fearsome Kamala Harris prosecutor, attorney general, or is this someone who, you know, seems really cool and um, maybe we'll hit it off? And Turned out it to be was both. really when she called, <laughs> I'm telling you, when she called me back in that miracle where she happened to be at her desk and I happened to be at my desk, which never happens, <laughs> and we basically talked for an hour and it's like, wow, she's really awesome. She's funny. She's smart. She, she's, you know, interesting. Um, let's do, I'm in. So let's, let's, and she happened to be in LA a few days later. And I said, she told me that I said, okay, we're going out. Amazing. Congrats on winning that fight, by the way, LA versus San Francisco. I lived in both. It's, it's a no brainer if we're being honest. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's we choose pretty, LA. It's pretty sweeter, well, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, yeah. I love it. Weather. And wait till you try some of the Italian food. <laughs> okay. After, <laughs> after, after, the the list. List. after the mic, <laughs> after we shut these off, you're going to give me a list so I, I can I can Perfect. spread spread out a little bit mm -hmm. from the uh, the Toscana. Scene. No offense to Toscana. I yeah, love they, Toscana. Yeah, the, the bread's cold, but it's okay. <laughs> okay, enough with you and Incredible. Toscana. Oh did you have a? Did they not <laughs> let you? Oh, I know what happened. They didn't let him in. They didn't give him a table, so he's bitter about it. <laughs> All right, we're going to let you get to your uh, fantasy draft. Doug Emhoff, thank you so much for coming on Pod Save America. Thanks for the time, and uh, good luck in the draft tonight. We're going to need it. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, guys. A couple of quick things before we go. Uh, Pod Save America is headed to Phoenix this Saturday, September 7th at Celebrity Theater. Join us, Dan, and guest host Jane Coaston for a great show featuring Senate candidate Ruben Gallego. Get your tickets at crooked.com slash events now. Still tickets. Grab them. We'll see you in Phoenix. Uh, and also in the newest episode of subscription-exclusive podcast Polar Coaster, Dan and Elijah Cohn map out how Harris can win the Electoral College and explore the campaign's possible routes to securing 270 electoral votes. To check out Dan's subscriber-exclusive show and so much more, subscribe to Friends of the Pod on Apple Podcasts or at cricket.com slash friends. That's our show for today. How about Doug? How great is Doug? I just want to go get dinner with Doug at Toscana or anywhere else, I guess. Anywhere else. God, <laughs> Toscana. What a blast. So much Toscana. It's a nice guy. It was very, a little too nice much guy. Toscana talk. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a, it was a personal issue. But you know what? He was fantastic. Thanks, second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, for coming by. Good luck with the draft tonight. Uh, we'll be back with a new show on Friday with Dan and me. We'll be talking about next week's debate with one of the moderators of the last one, CNN's Dana Bash. So tune in. Talk to you then.